Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Jenny Fields is the author of The Age of Desire and her latest novel, Atomic Love. Delia Owens, author of Where the Crawdads Sing, raves that Atomic Love is riveting, a highly charged love story that reveals the dangerous energy at the heart of every real connection. Let's join Putnam Executive Editor Tara Carlson in conversation with author Jenny Fields. Hi, I'm here with Jenny. Thank you so much for joining us from, where, where are you, Jenny? <laughs> I'm in Portland, Maine. Um, this is where I come in the summertime normally, although this year it won't be as long as usual because of the pandemic. And I'm admittedly extremely jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's Speaking nice and my, cool. <laughs> yeah, thousand square foot apartment where it is currently 90 degrees and my one and three year old were whisked away from the apartment for our podcast. <laughs> and is there, do, are, is there any... Con- is there like noise going on in your apartment? Yeah, I'm, I'm renting an apartment that is right next door to a building being built. So if you hear, um, you know, beeping and the sounds of motors, they're, they're working hard next door. So (laughs) I'm sorry for the extra background noise. That's okay. Thanks for Thanks for letting us know. Um, So I'm super excited to talk to you, Jenny, today about your book, Atomic Love, which I had the privilege of getting to edit with you. It was such, such a joy for me. Um, And I'm in love with this book. And I was thinking about our conversation today and what we would kind of chat about. And I was really struck by some of the parallels of the setting of the book. I mean, it's 1950s Chicago. Nothing on the face of it is immediately, you know, um, reminiscent of right now, except for the fact that people were, you know, there was a Cold War era. People were living in fear of the end of their world. And I think that the pandemic has some, you know, some similar feeling. I certainly That's have true. had moments of, you know, fearing that our world was never going to look the same and what is it going to be like? And um, yeah, so I was, um, I'm curious to hear from you. Well, I would love for you to describe Rosalind, who is our heroine, Rosalind Porter, and where she came from. Um, and then what you think she would make of our situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rosalind is a scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, she was the only woman on the early portion of the project um, helping to create the first atomic reaction. She's a physicist at a time when women just were not included in anything. And while she is not based on a real character, um, as far as her personality or her backstory, there really was a young woman, one young woman who was involved in the Manhattan Project, and her name was Leona Woods, and she was a brilliant, brilliant physicist. Um, And she was the youngest member of the project and a real pet of Enrico Fermi, who mentored her all through school and wanted her to be part of the project. And she had some very important roles in that project. Um, But unlike Leona Woods, Rosalind uh, did not want the bomb to drop. Um, A lot of people don't realize that a a great many of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project were, believed they were creating a deterrent. Uh, They never thought the bomb would drop. And right before it did drop, they signed a petition. Uh, Many, many scientists signed a petition to uh, President Truman begging him not to drop the bomb. They didn't even know whether the atmosphere would ignite when the bomb dropped. They really weren't sure. And so um, they, uh, they, they didn't want it to drop. Leona Woods did want it to drop, and so she was very different than Rosalind. But I think of Rosalind as a bird with a broken wing. I mean, at, here it is. It's, it's four and a half years after the war, and um, she's this brilliant woman um, but she was betrayed. I think there's a sort of innocence about Rosalind. Like she had very little personal experience uh, with man, for instance, in her life. And, um, 
you know, she was betrayed by the man that she loved and trusted. Um, well, yeah, what's, what is Rosalind's situation when we meet her in the novel? We know you know she was this brilliant physicist. What is she doing now when we meet her? Now she's selling jewelry at Marshall Fields. Um, in downtown Chicago, she's selling antique jewelry and she's lost her job. She's lost science. Um, in a way, science betrayed her. She absolutely loved physics and you know, she loved her position in the Manhattan Project. But when the bomb was dropped and she realized how many people were killed and the horror of so many citizens, particularly being killed, mm -hmm. really upset her. And um, she, you know, she was just bereft at that point. And right after that, the man that she loved, who was her colleague, uh, betrayed her made her lose her job, basically. And, um, and so she's lost science. She's lost her trust in science. And she's also lost this man. And she's now working in such, um, you know, I wouldn't say menial job. She makes the most of it. But it certainly doesn't use her talents. And um, she's, she's feeling really lost and very much alone. And that's why I, I say she's a bird with a broken wing. Um, with you asked, you asked what, go okay. ahead. Listen. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, I am curious to know what you think of, I mean, if Rosalind were here today, you know, this woman with a broken wing, who knows a lot about science, what would she think of our, yeah. our world and the, you know, the scientists who are at the helm of some of what's happening and what's not? Well, I think as a scientist, she would be absolutely shocked at the lack of belief in science right now. Yeah. I mean, science really was very important and, and science was king in 1950. Hmm. You know, we, we believed that science could solve a myriad of problems. Uh, the polio vaccine uh, shortly after that came out and, and, and saved the world from a horrible, horrible disease that mostly affected children. Um, you know, uh, better living through chemistry was a, one of the slogans of the era, you know, yeah. and people really believe science could solve every problem. But now there's this anti-science anti feel that's very disturbing. And I think Rosalind would have been angry about that and worried about that and upset about that. Yeah. As far as how she would survive the pandemic, I think she got very used to being alone. I mean, she has her friend Zeke, she has her, her family, and she absolutely adores her niece. Um, but I think she would, uh, she'd be okay being alone. I don't think that would be hard for her. She's so much in her head and she, she does think so intellectually and deeply. And I, I think she could amuse herself, but I think it would be, of course, she couldn't pay for her apartment because she's yeah, barely she paying for her house. apartment yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so interesting what you said about um, the 1950s being a time when people believed that science could solve everything. I think just any sense of a time where, you know, an, ent an entire nation could all agree on one thing and would all have such faith in, in anything seems like, um, I don't know, very nostalgic and, and beautiful to me right now when we're... Yes. Well, yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with the, our ability to reach, um, to, to reach people through media because yeah. there was, you know, you had three programs you could watch on TV if you had a TV. Right. Right. Or, right. That's her first TV. <laughs> yeah, right. She got her first TV. Radio was, uh, there were not that many choices on radio. Most of it was music. Some right. of it was news, but you know, it wasn't like uh, there were different voices speaking out and telling us what to believe. And, and well, that is a big and in that way, right now, the story is even more interesting because you know there is the the story of the Cold War and what was happening. You know what America did with the bomb and the the public facing way that the government talked about it. But then we have Thomas Weaver who is the man that Rosalind was in love with, her colleague who betrayed her. And then we have special agent Charlie, Sh Charlie Shudwell, who comes onto the scene. And through that, we start to get a very different narrative of what is actually at play uh, in the country and also um, 
you know, different thoughts about what's right and what's wrong. And, and um, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for Charlie's character and that kind of moral triangle that you're exploring there? It's funny because, you know, this doesn't happen very often, but Charlie came to me whole cloth. You asked, how did I come up with Charlie and his backstory? And it was just one day he just fell from the sky and he seemed so real to me. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about Charlie and that backstory? Yes. Yeah. Charlie um, was a prisoner of war in Japan and the prisoner of war camps in Japan were not protected by um, the Geneva Conventions. They were, you know, they never signed the Geneva Conventions, so they could do anything they wanted to their prisoners of war, and it was horrific, really horrific. And Charlie has been uh, maimed. He's lost the use of one hand completely during his time in the war camp uh, for a reason that, uh, you know, he really is a is a good human being. He he decided not to betray somebody um, who was kind to him, and therefore he was maimed by the um, people in the camp. And um, he's kind of just the opposite of Weaver in a way, because Weaver, um, it, I think he's really very ashamed of himself for uh, allowing the Russians to play him. And I don't want to say more because I'll yeah. give away the story. <laughs> but, um, but Charlie uh, would not betray anyone. He, he's just a good soul. And he's been himself hurt deeply. And, you know, um, if you ask me what's inspired me to write this novel, I'll tell you, I just came to the book thinking, I want to write about two birds with broken wings. That's how I thought of it. And people broken by the war, broken by love. He also has been terribly hurt by love after his hand was injured. Yeah. Um, the person he loved walked away. Um, and I want these people to find each other and heal each other because I think in the end, love is a healing process. I think we're all hurt by something and the people we love heal us. And I, I really wanted to write about that. And, um, and in fact, I, I came to the uh, thought that really Weaver also needs healing. They're all people in need of healing, that the whole world was very burned by the war in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I also wanted to write about, about a woman scientist. My mother was a scientist um, during World War II. Um, she wow. did cancer research. Wow. Was that yeah. in, um, and was that in Chicago? You're from, you grew up in Chicago, right? You I were did. I Chicago. did. I grew up in Chicago and she was at the University of Chicago. She got her degree there and she uh, worked there after her degree doing cancer research, got her name on an important cancer paper. Um, and then my father came along and that's what women did. I mean, it was after the war, GIs had come back, they needed jobs. And so when my father asked her to marry him, she just walked away from her career and she regretted it her entire life. Did she life. talk about it to you? Yes. Up? Yeah, she really did. She said, well, she encouraged me constantly never walk away from your career. And I did have a career before I was a writer. I mean, I was, I've always been a writer. And even during my career, I was writing and publishing novels, but I was uh, in advertising. And she said, never walk away from your career. And, you know, this is, this is very personal and kind of sad, but my father was very difficult, man, terribly mm. difficult. And, um, you know, I would say, why don't you leave him, mom? And she would say, what would I do? I, I wouldn't have any money. I wouldn't know what to do. And she didn't want me to be in the same position. Mm -hmm. So um, she always, always encouraged me with my career. And she held on to so many of the things she learned as a scientist in being a housewife. <laughs> it was almost hilarious because she measured everything. And she was, she was very much a perfectionist. And, you know, she didn't just, you know, clean the floor. She, she understood which chemicals would strip the wax before she re-waxed the floor. And uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> everything it, it, was science. Yes. Anything was science just, and she 
would read up on science all the time and share articles with me about health and science. And those things really still interested her until the day she died. And did that trickle down to you? Oh, absolutely. It, it really did. Um, I, when I was in advertising, the, the latter part of my advertising career, I worked on a lot of um, uh, drugs and mm -hmm. um, how to reach people who needed them, often like telling them about diseases they didn't know or things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it was just uh, to the side. I mean, I, I, I created the Lunesta Moth. I don't know if you remember that really? campaign. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My partner, who is an art director, I mean, um, you know, there's art director and writer work together. We created the Lunesta Moth and that campaign was very, very successful helping people sleep. Yeah. Um, but I loved reading the scientific papers. I attended FDA hearings. Huh. I was at the FDA hearing to approve um, Advil going over the counter. Huh. Um, and I met the scientist who invented Advil. He was this wonderful little British man. And he said, oh, you know, my daughters needed it. So I created it, you know. And uh, he invented three important drugs, um, including naproxen, which is now Aleve, huh. and, and, and another one that isn't as popular. But I mean, what an amazing man. He never made a penny on it, by the way, because he did it for boots. <laughs> wow. Pharmaceuticals in England. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's fascinating. Oh, the world of, I, the world of science is so rich for fictionalization because I, I think it's pretty um, opaque to the common person. I have no idea how any of this works, but <laughs> any of it, you know, comes to be. I just think that's fascinating. Um, thank you for sharing that. I mean, well, also being in advertising, maybe similar to Rosalind, you were very much a woman in a man's world, I imagine. Yes. Did that kind of feed into any of how you wrote about Rosalind or were there scenes, yes. parts of yourself you recognized there? Yes, you, uh, you might remember in the book, um, she realizes that in order to be heard in a room full of men who were all talking, she had to lower her voice. If she <laughs> got upset um, and her voice went high, which is what is natural for a woman when she's upset. They didn't hear a word she said, but if she lowered a voice and the softer she spoke, the more they heard her because they would lean in and start to listen. And her voice became more important because she learned how to handle that. And that certainly was true for me and my career. Those are lessons I wish I could remember in the heat of the <laughs> Yeah, it is hard to learn how to do that. my forte. Yeah. <laughs> so did you have to do a lot of research for the novel or, um, yeah, how did you create this world so well? Yeah, I, I read a lot. Um, I read about the atomic bomb. I read, for instance, Richard Rhodes wrote an amazing book called The Making of the Atomic Bomb. Hmm. I read autobiographies written by Leona Woods. Um, and uh, who was the woman who really was part of the Manhattan Project and her relationship to Fermi and the things, you know, for instance, they would go swimming in Lake Michigan after work, all of them. And I mean, that I would never. Real? I didn't know that yes. scene was real. I thought that scene was actually, I thought at one time about suggesting that you cut it because something was a little bit sort of sexual feeling about yeah. it, but that's real. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I, the most interesting thing I read, to tell you the truth, were um, first-person narratives uh, from people who were prisoners of war in Japanese camps. And while nothing ever happened to them, just like what happened to Charlie, that was fictional, um, it was riveting to read those. They were very complex and deep and interesting and how these people survived and how they felt about survival. A lot of people felt guilty for surviving when so many people did not survive around them. They were hungry, you know, they, they had very, very, they were, you know, because they were undernourished and they were treated so, so badly and their descriptions of the camps and what they were like and the fire in the middle of the room that burned two hours a day to keep them warm. I mean, it's just, just really remarkable. Another thing I always do when I'm writing a historic novel 
is I read magazines and newspapers of the era. I think that that is the best way to understand attitudes, to see how much the clothes cost, to see what is being, you know, pushed forward. Read the women's page in any magazine from any time and you'll find out what people think of what women should be doing at that point, you know. Yeah. And just the fact that it was called the woman's page will tell you everything. Right. Right. As as opposed to arts and, you know, or whatever. Right. right. Oh, that's fascinating. Do you have these magazines still on hand or was it all library research? Most of it was library research. Sometimes I buy them on eBay. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it is really wonderful to have the real magazine in your hand because you can really look at the pages and how it feels. Um, so I usually buy a few magazines of the era. In fact, I just ordered some for my next book. <laughs> um, and, uh, and newspapers are just so important, especially when it comes to news. Like it was so vital to me to understand how the how the public was feeling at that point about the Russian, you know, scare, the red scare was just everywhere. Um, the point where I'm writing, um, you know, Joseph McCarthy was just beginning. I mean, he really wasn't uh, a loud voice yet, but he was enough of a you know, a gnat in the ear of a lot of people. And, um, you know, that was important for me to see how far along that had come and what people were saying, what the Chicago Tribune was saying. Well, the FBI was not very old, right? The FBI was pretty new. Well, I believe the FBI began in in the 1930s. Right. Um, And so, uh, you know, after the war, a lot of GIs came back. It was the first point where the FBI would allow somebody who wasn't fully able-bodied to join them. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of research to find out because here's Charlie has only one right. hand. Are they going to allow him to come? And after the war, they did allow some people if they could handle the basic training, and he did. So Charlie is just my... I mean, I love Rosalind. I think she's so inspirational, but I'm in love with Charlie. (laughs) I mean, when you talk about giving him this backstory and how he's just this wounded man, I think there is something in every woman that wants to find and fix a broken man. It's very, I don't know. Have you ever watched Friday Night Lights? I don't know if that's your cup of tea. Probably not. (laughs) Oh, it it probably would be actually. And I've been meaning to watch that and I haven't, but I agree that, um, you know, great pandemic, um, lose yourself, you know, for a little while, but I just, I mean, a very high drama, but Tim, Tim Riggins, it, Charlie feels to me like a 1950s Tim Riggins with actual Leo skeletons in his closet. But I mean, he's just such a beautiful soul who, like you said, has this broken wing and, Mm. um, I just love him. I think readers are going to love him. I hope, I hope they love him like I do. I hope so too. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I I think I probably made you put more and more Charlie and I think I did. (laughs) It's like more Charlie, more Charlie, please. (laughs) Was there any part of our, um, you know, editorial process that was surprising or difficult? Well, you know, it was only difficult in that I rewrote the book about 10 times. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I have never rewritten a book so much, but I was so, you know, dedicated to getting it right. And I yeah. really, really wanted to, you know, get it where I thought it was perfect. The enjoyable part was that um, you, you, and you know this, you were very part of, big part of a collaborative effort um, to help by giving me some wonderful suggestions. Oh, and that's very I, kind. I that. wasn't digging for compliments. I just wanted to know. <laughs> well, you that's know, you, you, you suggested a plot twist at the end that I never would have come up with. And I think it was, I think it made all the difference. And, um, you know, I just, I was in advertising, so I'm used to collaboration and writing is a very solitary process. You, yeah. you're at home for, years, literally writing a book. Nobody knows about it. I don't usually share it until it's, you know, well past its first draft, probably in its second or third draft. And you're doing it with no feedback whatsoever. And if you're a typical writer, every day you read what you wrote last night and you go, 
well, that sucks. What was I thinking? (laughs) And, um, and it's really good to get feedback and it's really wonderful to have someone say, you know, this part just, I thought if you could do this, it might be better. It's exciting to me because I love being given a thought and seeing where it goes and seeing, you know, watching it bloom. To me, that's very exciting. And I'm not somebody who has to own every word of my book. I mean, I feel like you really made it a better book and I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. And, And this is not your first book. This is not your debut. I believe this is your fifth book. Right. right. But it it's is. the first one, it's the first one we've worked on together. And I feel right. very privileged about that. Um, was the experience of writing this book very different than writing any of your previous books? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I have to say I have never cracked the code of how to write a novel. I don't know that I ever will. You know, I know there are people and they just outline their books. They know exactly what's going to happen and they sit down and they write it. I'm just not like that. A book has to come out of the characters for me, you hmm. know? And I, I, I don't always know where it's going to go. I just, I try to create characters and allow them to tell me where it's going to go. I give them an insoluble problem and let them solve it for me. (laughs) Um, I have never done something that um, was, uh, you know, a suspense book before. And so this was new for me in that sense. Um, I usually write about people's lives and it's not really about suspense. I try to make people turn the pages no matter what. Um, It's always the goal. (laughs) What? I said, that's always the goal. That's always the goal. Yes, it certainly is. But um, that was challenging because I'm not really so much a reader of suspense, although I like it. Um, But I just, this story came to me and I can't even explain why. Um, You know, like I said, I wanted to write about two birds with broken wings. I didn't know it would become a suspense It's funny to me to hear you talk about it as a novel of suspense, because there is a suspense element, but I think your goal of writing about two birds with broken wings, I think that is ultimately what the novel ended up, for me at least, being about it. What really drew me to it is this story of, is these characters, is Rosalind and the choice that she has to make between these two men and also what what she's going to do, um, you know, with what Charlie asks her to do in spying on, on Weaver. And, um, I mean, you just, you tackle a lot of big, complex moral questions. Was that easier to do in this novel than in pre than in your last novel? Because these are all fictional characters. As you said, you like to create characters and then you let them sort of dictate what you do. How do you do that when it's a real person with a real life? And your last book was on, um, was it Edith Edith Wharton? Wharton? Yeah. Edith Wharton. Uh, I, (laughs) you know, I really enjoyed writing the book about Edith Wharton because she is my favorite writer. And this was the story that I told about her having an affair when she was 45 was just the antipathy of what people think of when they think of Edith Wharton. They just don't think of her as being somebody who had this extramarital affair and you know who with a younger man and so Mm -hmm. that interested me and it was really I love her so much so and she left so many diaries and letters and it was great doing that but there were things that she did that really upset me you know like I didn't want to think that she acted like a 16 year old when she fell in love at 45, but she did. And I had to put it in as it was written in her diaries, in her letters. And um, sometimes I found that very upsetting. Like people are gonna think I made, I made this woman giddy at the fa- in the face of love and they'll think I made it up, but I didn't make it up. It really was the way it was. So um, that bothered me and I didn't wanna do that again. And so I wanted to write about somebody who was my own creation, who I could choose how she, how she lived. And I enjoy reading books about real people, but 
to me, this was a more satisfying process to tell you the truth, to really explore Rosalind, to have her be healed by love, to find out how things work and, and to give her all these complex moral choices that she had to make and, you know, really put her in a position of what would you do? You know, you, you, yeah. I want you to read this and wonder how you would have reacted yeah. if you were put in that same position. Absolutely. Um, in some ways, the book, I mean, it's about Rosalind, it's about Charlie, it's about Weaver, but it's also in some ways a love letter to Chicago. So is that, um, you know, what were some of your favorite things? You grew up there. What were some of your favorite things about Chicago? What do you miss? When, when did you last live there? Oh, I lived there uh, in last time in 1989. So quite a while back. Yeah. Um, I just think Chicago is such a spirited city, such a wonderful city. And I should disclose, I'm also from outside of Chicago. So we've got two lovers of Chicago here. <laughs> right. Um, you know, this is the way I've always thought of Chicago. You know, I thought of Chicago as the second son who doesn't get the inheritance and doesn't get the attention, you know, and has to make it on his own. And whereas New York, New York is the son that, you know, inherits it all and everybody <laughs> pays attention to that son. This one just goes off and does it. And I think Chicago has that brawniness and that wonder to it. I also think it's an incredibly beautiful city. You know, being on the lakefront yeah. is just, people don't realize how incredibly beautiful it is. It's the other thing I just love about Chicago and have always loved about Chicago is it's honest. There's no pretense. Nobody puts on airs there. You are who you are, and they expect you to be who you are. And yet, mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, it's, you know, it's not just beer and, you know, and uh, sports. It's just pulsing with art and theater. And, you know, the best theater I've ever seen was in Chicago at the Goodman Theater, at mm -hmm. the Steppenwolf Theater. And... You know, my favorite thing that I miss so much is the Art Institute. I put yeah. it in the book. Um, yeah. I went there almost every Saturday as a child. I would go down on the train. I grew up in the suburbs and I would go down on the train and go to the Art Institute. I, I knew exactly how to get there from walking quite a ways from the train. I knew every painting. When they changed one of the rooms, the, the room with the uh, Impressionists, I was so upset. Like, you can't move that. That's not where it's supposed to be. You know, for, for me, it's the best art museum in the world. And I really do miss it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh. Um, well, what are you reading right now? Or what have you read recently to get you through these last many months? Oh, boy. Um, I'm one of those people that even if I'm in the midst of reading a book, I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> um, I, uh, I read The Salt Path, which um, was sent to me by um, my British editor, which I don't even know if it's available in the U.S., but I believe it is, about a woman whose husband finds out he's dying and they walk the trail in Cornwall hmm. for, and they live, they live rough out of tents for like a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of fit the pandemic. I'm reading Manhattan Beach right now by Jennifer mm -hmm. Egan, which is set in Brooklyn mm -hmm. in the 1930s. And I lived in Brooklyn for 25 years. So it, it interests me. And I think her writing's wonderful. I reread The Goldfinch because I just loved it so much and I wanted to read it again. I wanted to understand why do I love this book so much? Um, and um, I, I read Howard's End, which I haven't read in years, and that was fun to read again. Um, let's see. And do you read physical, or do you do audio, or e Well, right now, I'm pretty much um, just reading ebooks because um, I guess I just feel as I can have what I want when I want it, and um, there's some beauty to that. I have to admit, I like reading ebooks. So um, I also I was asked by the Wall Street Journal to name my favorite spy novel, and all I could think of was James Bond books. And so um, I read uh, William Boyd's Restless, and I absolutely loved it about a woman who's trained to be a spy. And um, I hadn't read it before <laughs> I wrote my book, but I just thought it was just brilliant. And, um, 
Uh, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I read The Great Believers uh, by Rebecca McKay about, um, you know, the AIDS crisis. And that seemed uh, Is that appropriate. set in Chicago? She's a Chicago writer. She is. And it's set in Chicago. Yeah. Indeed. Yes, mm-hmm. wonderful. Well, thank you so much for <laughs> looking up everything you're reading. Sorry <laughs> to put it on the spot. And for just uh, for your time chatting with me and telling me more, I mean, you've shared some things that even I didn't know about the book after working with you for more than a year and a half. So um, that's always very fun to get to learn. Thank you so much. And now here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. The hot touch of the city still on her. Rosalind unfastens her stockings and drops them in the bathroom sink with a handful of washing soda. A habit from the war years. She made it through 1942 to 1944 with two stalwart pairs because she treated them like rare orchids. Jesus. She knew girls who had to draw lines up the backs of their legs because they'd torn their last pair and couldn't buy new. Lines that by 2 p.m. were smeared like lipstick after a desperate kiss. One didn't lose the feel of the war, the rationing, the terror of opening the newspaper each morning and seeing the worst. Rosalind would never forget the sting in her throat watching the man next door weep as he changed the blue star on his son's in-service flag to gold. There were no sons in her family, but she and Louisa did their bit. For a while, Louisa polished torpedoes in a defense plant. And what Rosalind did, one might say, ended the war altogether. But she knows it will haunt her until she dies. These days, she stands behind the used and antique jewelry counter at Marshall Field's department store, sorting and selling. There are lives entwined in the artifacts she peddles tucked behind an oval of glass on the back of a Victorian brooch, a perfectly braided plate of silver hair from someone's mother, a ring glittering with a row of gems, a ruby, emerald, garnet, amethyst, another ruby, and a diamond. The first letters of each spelling regard. Georgian men gave these rings to women they loved but couldn't marry. Rosalind can't help wondering about a woman who'd wear evidence of love she could never fully possess. Rosalind is a scientist. After the war, returning GIs took the important jobs back from women. You can go now, we've returned. Chances are she'd have lost her spot even if things hadn't gone wrong with Weaver. It doesn't mean she doesn't miss her days in the lab. On her way home, Stepping out of fields tonight, tired and sad, she passed an extraordinarily tall man leaning against the summer frolic window. He was openly staring at her with remarkable blue eyes. At Wabash, she glimpsed him again. When she crossed Erie, there he was, his fedora pulled low over his brow, hurrying to catch the light. Broad-shouldered, powerful-looking, with a purposeful stride. That's when Rosalind noticed he was pressing his left wrist against his ribs, like a woman holding a purse to keep it from being stolen. A war injury, maybe? He must have trailed her onto Lakeshore Drive, for when she turned down the street to her entrance, she caught a flash of blue eyes watching from across the street. Frank, her doorman, ushered her in. Miss Porter. Best time of year, isn't it? Maybe that fellow was just going her way, a coincidence. All through the war, men flirted with her until they found out what she did. Braininess always blunted her appeal. Now that she's 30 years old and still unmarried, people have begun to call her handsome. She hates the damn word. It would bolster her self-esteem to have a stranger find her attractive. Her biggest fear is that she will become that woman, the one who lives alone, whom no one notices when she walks down the street, a woman who's become invisible, negligible. Poor Miss Porter. She never had much of a life. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.